Hello and welcome to Aspire Church Manchester. The message you're about to hear was recorded live at one of our recent services. If you stick around at the end, we'll give you more information about our ministry. But for now, enjoy the preaching. Disciples. I know that's not too uh, uplifting of a title, but it's reality, isn't it? You know, Christians go through things. It's what I love about the Word of God and I hate about religion. Religion tries to paint Christians and religious people and biblical uh, events as if they're some, you know, angelic beings floating through life. But when you read the Bible, you realize there's nothing could be further from the truth. It's real people with real lives, with real jobs and real families and real opposition and struggling with their own flesh to serve God. And they go through some things. And so do you and I. So as we learn what these discouraged disciples did and how Jesus interacted with them, guess what? We can find some help for our souls. We can find some encouragement for our lives. How many like being encouraged? It feels good. So uh, our our text in just a minute is going to be Luke chapter 24. We'll get there in just a second. But I want to kind of set the scene for you so you understand where these disciples were at and what the narrative was uh, in their life, the backstory, if you will. So Jesus had just died, which was sad, and they were uh, discouraged because of that. They had been going, uh, you can read in Luke 24, verse 1, through down through the middle of the chapter, that they were going to the tomb. This was it, man. They were bringing spices. They were going to lay it on his body, and it was going to be, that's it. That's all she wrote. That's it. End of story. All of our hopes and dreams are gone, buried in a tomb. The thing was, though, when they got there, they were met with a couple of what the Bible says, two men. Other translations say two angels. But one thing we know for sure, they were in some dazzling clothes. They were in some shiny, bright white clothes, and they were there at the tomb. And the uh, stone that was blocking the tomb had been rolled away. And these two men in dazzling apparel were there to inform those that had came to the tomb uh, uh, that Jesus wasn't there. And they used this really cryptic phrase that just kind of like sends a chill up my spine when I read it. They said, Why do you seek the living among the dead? They begin to also remind these people who were coming to the tomb that Jesus had promised this, says, I was going to die at the hands of sinful men and that for me to die was part of uh, the Father's plan. After hearing this, they remembered, the Bible says. And the ones who remembered were all of the ladies Mary Magdalene, Joanna, uh, Mary, the mother of James. And the Bible says there were some other women who were there with them. And they all remembered these words that Jesus had said. So they take all this information. They take all of this thing that was going on. And they run back to the apostles. And they tell the apostles, look what happened. The apostles, all men, refused to listen. (laughs) They said, oh, you're crazy. You've gone too far. You're over the edge. And they didn't. Listen, but Peter, one of the men who was there listening, something triggered in him, and he ran to the tomb. This was kind of like how Peter was. He was a a very enthusiastic kind of guy, very aggressive kind of guy. Sometimes he would say things out of of turn, (laughs) things he shouldn't say, do things he shouldn't do, but uh, his enthusiasm could could, uh, 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 not be, it was great, it was good ran to the tomb and he sees these things uh, and he finds the linen cloth that Jesus had uh, been wearing or had been buried in and it was there by itself and the Bible says that Peter marveled at this. So here's the scenario. Here's what had taken place. A buzz was now going amongst the community, especially amongst those who had been Jesus' followers. That's where we pick up the story here. Are you with me? Did I lay it out for you? Do you got it? Okay, verse 13 says, That very day, so that same day that all this took place, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from 
Jerusalem. <laughs> it seemed, when I read that, I thought, that's so far, walking seven miles. You know, in our world that we live in, we, we walk a mile. We think we've walked loads, you know. Seven miles, and you come from other places where there's not so much transportation. You understand this. So that's what they were doing. It says they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. So here they are, Jesus followers. They're on the road to Emmaus and long walk, seven miles, and they're having this discussion. This happened and that happened, and here's what's been going on. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself (laughs) drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty indeed, uh, and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and the rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. Then verse 21, very telling, very telling, very uh, uh, opening up, bringing vision, bringing clarity to where they were at. It says, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today asking today, Lord God, for your grace and mercy. I pray, God, that I would decrease. You know how I feel and what's going through my mind and my heart, Lord God. And I cast those cares upon you. Today, at this moment, Lord God, I just need to be your instrument. I just need to speak with clarity and understanding so that minds would be challenged today, that things would be provoked within spirits of of your people that hearts would be motivated to greater Christian living and that lives would be transformed by you, Lord Jesus. I thank you, God, for what you're doing in people's lives and I pray you would continue to do it and even more so, save souls. Bring that backslider back. I pray those who are religious and are just drifting uh, in other churches around the, the, the place, not really finding you that need to be here, draw them, God, draw them. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Discouraged disciples. These Jesus followers were discouraged. Now, I know in some Christian circles, if you're a Jesus follower, you should never be discouraged. I remember years ago, I had to get my big toe operated on in in Liverpool when I was living there and uh, a guy was asking me doctor what I was doing I said I'm a pastor of a church and trying to get a church started here and so on and so forth he goes oh you're a Christian then I go here it comes and so he cuts open my toe and then after and the nurse tells him doctor we need to prescribe him painkillers he doesn't need painkillers he's a born-again Christian I'm thinking like, I need painkillers, man. I'm a born-again Christian, but I need painkillers. But sometimes that's the way people think, right? They have this uh, a misunderstanding of what it means to be a Christian. And sometimes people think Christians should never be discouraged or, or, or never we should never be discouraged. But sometimes we, they think we never are discouraged. And sometimes you might feel like you're less than a full child of God because you're discouraged going through it and feel down. I'm here to tell you, you're amongst good company. The word discouraged means this, and it's very important, this definition. It means to lack courage or hope or confidence. The reason I bring that out, lacking courage, hope, or confidence, it's quite diverse, isn't it? Because sometimes you need courage to carry on. You know, I've never been one of these guys, but uh, I know people that struggle to get up in the morning because they just can't face another day. Trust me, I've been discouraged, but I've never needed the courage for that. But I've needed courage sometimes to face situations in my life that I just rather not. Sometimes you need hope because you just feel like there's no future. Why bother? Confidence. Maybe you've lacked confidence at one day. Gracie and I have talked with this oodles. When we were young for decades, man, we were confident people. We just knew that everything was going to work out and that God was going to be there and that whatever came our way, we could handle. 
But somewhere along the line and at different various times, you can face discouragement where your confidence is stripped from you. That's where these disciples were at. They were facing all three of these in one go. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 24, our same chapter here in verse 16, it says, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Now, some authors think that that was God ordained and God somehow, for some reason, uh, uh, made them to not be able to recognize Jesus. I, I guess they know more than me, but I can't really understand or, or reason why God would do that. Others think that it's just themselves keeping their, their, their situation or their circumstances or, or all that was going on. They just had trouble recognizing him. I think this is probably more to the point because discouragement and depressed attitudes often blockade our spiritual sight and cause us not to see God. We just see the world or the devil or ourselves and it begins to be more discouraging. It can bring that kind of uh, depressed attitude. The next verse, verse 17 says this, so Jesus is there. And he says to them, what is this conversation you are holding with each other as you walk? He was trying to get them to talk. Obviously, he knew. How many know God knows? You don't have to tell him. He's already figured it out. But he's doing this because he wants to get them to, hey, do you recognize this voice? Guess who? Guess who? And then... The Bible says that after he did that, that they stood still looking sad. Stood still. I think those words are very significant and important. Because when people get discouraged, when they lack hope or vision or or, or the, the, the drive to continue forward in their spiritual life, in their life sometimes, then they stand still. They don't move forward. And I have to say that one of the sad things about pastoring for many years is seeing people that year after year after year, they remain in the same spiritual condition, that they basically are just standing still in their life. And they're just kind of like going through the motions. And I think that they're often in a perpetual state of discouragement. They don't say it like that. It's hard to admit it, but when you think of discouragement being sometimes lacking courage, other times lacking hope, and sometimes not having confidence, it seems easy to me to think that someone could be in this state of discouragement for quite some time. And that's a sad thing. And so were these disciples, says they were looking sad. Can I tell you, when you're discouraged, sometimes inner sadness comes along with that comes along with that that thing and you know sometimes for us macho men who think we're strong and think we're tough and we can handle things we don't like to tell people we're sad we don't like to use that term but honest truth is as oftentimes we find ourselves sad because all christians go through this see discouragement what i'm trying to get across is discouragement can bring the christian journey to a standstill can bring it to a standstill And there's nothing worse than being on a Christian journey, on a life for God, and it just be nothing, man. It just be church, it just be home, it just be life and nothing going on. And oftentimes what happens is people go, yeah, it is discouraging. I think I'll just get off. And they just get off and they just stop. They go, why bother? And this is the strategy of discouragement. This is what the devil's trying to do with discouragement, isn't he? He's trying to get you to stop, get you to quit not to sort it out and figure it out, but to just quit. See, the cause of their discouragement is important, and it's important because it's similar to why many get discouraged in our day. And it's something that I'm sure we've discussed uh, uh, over time because it's just a a perennial set of problems. It's deferred promises and delayed answers. We believe God's promises, but sometimes it's not for today. Today. We like God's promises, but when we don't get them in our time, those deferred, deferred become a struggle, become a struggle, deferred 
promises, answers that God is going to give us and we want them, but sometimes they're delayed. I used to tell my kids, I say, hey, dad, can we do this? And I say, we'll see. Because we'll see, it depends on a lot of things, right? It depends on, do we have the money? Do we have the time? Does it fit in with the other thing? We'll see. They hated we'll see. They go, you just, just say no. Because every time you say we'll see, that means you mean no. I said, no, it means we'll see. And God sometimes says, we'll see. It's a delayed answer, but we just take it as no, just as no. And this brings discouragement. These followers, these ones that we just read about in Luke 24, thought that Jesus had come to set up a government. And they thought that this government was going to help the Jews to come out from under the oppression of the Roman government. And they were all excited about this. They couldn't wait. Some of them even wanted to be part of Jesus' cabinet. Hey, don't forget us. When you get to your place of power, Jesus just looked and went, hmm, hmm, you're not really getting this, are you? So this is what they thought, that all of this was going to happen, and Jesus was going to be the great redeemer of Israel, and Israel was going to go back to its uh, uh, favored nation status. But the reality was, Jesus was meant to be crucified at the hands of the Roman government. And when that happened, wow, this was shocking. They had high hopes for what Jesus was going to do. But then what he did was unexpected. Oftentimes, God does unexpected things. You expect this. You, 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 you've got steps one, two, and three and then God goes to step Z. You're thinking, wait, that doesn't even make sense here. One, two, and three, you didn't even go to four or, or, or 12. You just went to a, a letter. You know, th- this is what God does, and you're, you're shocked. You can't figure it out. It doesn't make sense. It brings discouragement. And what happened were these two on the Emmaus Road that we just read about had lost their passion for God because this is what discouragement does is you begin to lose your passion for God. Well, it's better. I'll just go down to the pub and have a few drinks and I'll feel better. Well, I'll just go to a club and a dance and have a good time. I'll, I'll, I'll just stop going to church. I'll just quit serving. I'll just quit being part of the church because I tried all that. It doesn't work out. And they had lost their passion for God. And the problem wasn't in their heads. It was in their hearts. This is what's so hard. And I have to tell you that as a father... As a, as, a, as a leader, as a pastor, it makes it so difficult because I can speak to your head. You have a question, I can answer it for you. But only God can speak to your heart. Only God can sort your heart. Only you know what's in your heart. And there's been so many times where I sat down with people, talk with them about things, and I'm giving them things for their head, which are good things and important things. But really, they're harboring something in their heart. And that's where they were, these disciples that were discouraged because they felt God had failed them. God, we had been waiting for this Messiah to come and be our leader, and Jesus came, and we thought that he was going to help us out. They thought their dream was over. Have you ever felt like that? Where you felt like your dream was over? Man, I married this girl. I married this guy. Things were going to be okay. We started this business, got this new job. We moved to this new location. Things were going to happen for us, and then it didn't. didn't work out. You feel like your dream's over. Discouragement. Now you lack confidence, and you lack hope, and it's just going rough. You would think that Jesus at this point would, like, say something like, Hey, hey, snap out of it. Snap out of it. You know, sometimes I think like when I'm discouraged that maybe like it's like Jesus is discouraged too. Maybe he's going through these things. Maybe he feels like this. I know my mind tells me no, but I act like that. I just think like if I'm discouraged, that's it. I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. God just doesn't even seem to care. He Maybe he's like discouraged too. You would think that if Jesus was in this place going, Come on, you discouraged guys. You don't, want to get on, you don't want to get on with the program. I'm going to just start over with a new crew. I'll just get some new people. 
A lot of people think this in their life. I'll get a new church. I'll get a new husband, new wife, new job, something new. That, that'll help. But Jesus didn't do that. He looked directly at these discouraged disciples, and then he begins to question them. In my family, I'm known as the lawyer because I ask questions about them, and I interrogate my kids, and I interrogate my grandkids. And the reason I do is because I'm trying to find out what's going on so that I can bring some help. And oftentimes, this is what Jesus does. He questions us, and he says things, and he questions these guys. Say, what are you guys talking about? What's going on here? Come on, give me some things that are taking place. He didn't really like their answer, so he begins to stimulate them with a direct approach. Let's read it together, okay? Luke 24 and verse 24. Luke 24, 24. Some of those who were with, who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. So he, they're answering the question. And then in verse 25, and Jesus says to them, he doesn't go, hey, guys, don't worry, man. Everything's okay. Hey, guys, everything's fine. He says, oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. See that exclamation point? That's important. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? He's telling them, come on, you know these things. You've learned these things. You've been around for a while. This isn't new. And then it says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So he goes on and begins to teach them or reteach them all these things, but catch the fact that he calls them foolish ones because when we live in spiritual discouragement for an extended period of time, what it really means is that we're acting foolishly because we're not trusting. And that's why he says you're slow of heart. That's kind of code word for lacking faith. Sometimes we have to stimulate our faith. Faith is not something we feel. It's something we choose. I'm faced up against this. I don't have any money. What am I going to do? I, I'm about to lose my job. What am I going to do? Uh, my kids are acting crazy and on drugs, and I don't know what to do. What do I do? And someone says, you need to trust God. And you're like, what? Wait. That's a choice. You choose to believe, or you choose not to believe. He was trying to get them to choose to believe. This had some impact on them. It did. They were Motivated by, look what verse 28 says. We're following along the chapter here. So they drew near to the village to which they were going, and Jesus acted as if he was going further, but they urged him strongly. How did they urge him? Strongly. Strongly. That's an important word. That's an adverb. That tells us how how they urged him, how they did it. It wasn't just, hey, Jesus, what do you think? Hey, guy. No strongly it was strong encouragement as a parent you know sometimes you got to strongly encourage that child to do the right thing if you just go come on peter don't do that peter if your name's peter i'm not talking about you uh, you know that's not good enough sometimes it's like no come here right now we're going to do this this is not the time to go playing around this is the time where we eat we're going to eat together got it don't be like me, but this, you get the point that I'm trying to make here. This is what they were doing, strongly urging him. Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So the strong urging that they were giving him was that they wanted him to remain with them. Sometimes we have to strongly urge the Lord through strong prayer God, I need you here with me. And if you don't sense him there, maybe your prayer, listen to this, needs to be a little stronger. Maybe there needs to be more enthusiasm behind it. Because let me tell you something. If you just remain in this condition, I want to tell you more assaults are going to come against your life. 
If you allow discouragement to be part of your life and you just kind of go through the motions and live half discouraged, half full of faith, uh, I want to tell you, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. You're going to have to make a decision saying, no, I need Jesus here now. I need the Lord in my life. I, I've been fooling around for far too long. I need to make some decisions in my life. Follow Christ with all that I have. Uh, and Lord, uh, I need you in my life right now. Lord, I urge, I'm urging you strongly, stay with me. Verse 30 says, when he was at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. I want you to see this. He communes with them. He breaks bread with them. That strong urging, stay with me, paid off. Can I tell you, man, if you will not give up, if you'll press in, keep coming to church, read your Bible regularly through a book every day, something in that book, in a book of the Bible I'm talking about, book of John, book of James, and read through it every day. Pray every day. Even when you don't feel like praying, even when you don't feel like reading, you do it and you say, God, I need you. Speak through this book to me. Some people say, Pastor, how, how do you get things? I read it. I don't see what you see. And that's because you don't read like I read. <laughs> and I don't mean that to sound uh, pompous or, or boastful. I just want to say, you can have all that I have and more. It depends on how much you want to urge God to come to you. How much do you want to get out of this scripture? Are you with me? This intimacy, this closeness, this fellowship that they had with Jesus was beginning to thaw their discouragement. It was beginning to take away some of the things that were bringing them hopelessness in their life. They begin to have this hope and faith Renewed confidence. We don't see it listed explicitly, but we're going to see how it takes place in just a minute here. See, so let me just reiterate before we move on to our next point here, that if you're discouraged, keep walking the road. You know, if if I would have followed my feelings, I would have been back in America about four years, three, four years ago. I, I would have been back there with with a lot better paycheck and a lot easier life and all of that. But I knew, man, that's not the road God put for me on. God had called me to sacrifice. He called me to a life of this. And as hard as it was, I said, man, I've got to stay on the road he has ordained for me. And I want to tell you today, God has a road ordained for you. You say, man, my marriage isn't working out. These things aren't going good. We're talking about divorce. First of all, that's bad news. Don't ever talk about divorce. Even if you feel like divorcing, don't talk about it. Because once you start talking about it, the next step is doing it. But maybe you're feeling all of these feelings right now. Stay on the road. Jesus kept them on the road to Emmaus there. Are you following with me today? So what happened next to to these disciples is helpful for us. It shows how Jesus responds to discouraged disciples and it shows how he's going to respond to us when we're discouraged. So we're going to skip all the way down to Luke 24 and verse 31. And before we read it, I want to say the first thing he did was he opened their eyes. He opened their eyes. The Bible says in verse 31, and their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Wow, that was important because we just read 15 verses earlier that they didn't even know who he was. They had walked with him for three years and yet here he is talking with them. They didn't even get the, 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 the sound of his voice because that's what happens when you're discouraged. You don't recognize it's God, it's God. The pastor, your wife, or your friend can tell you, hey, this is the Lord. And you say, no, man, I'm discouraged. I don't even, you can't even hear the voice of God. But now, once they communed with Jesus after urging him strongly to stay, now he opens their eyes and they recognized him. Oh, it was Jesus. And that's why you hear testimonies. I was going through this and this happened and he was there all the time. Have you heard people say that? 
That's because their eyes were blinded by their discouragement. But when they got into communion with Jesus, man, now they say, oh, there he is. You were there all the time, weren't you? And he just smiles. Because this is what happens when you commune with Jesus. He opens blind eyes. See, discouragement and despair are often coupled with spiritual blindness. This lack of spiritual sight is in so many Christians today. They can only see what's in front of them. They can only see the problems. And then when they get blessed, they only see the blessings. They don't see, why did those problems come? How did those problems occur? What's the purpose of those problems? Blessing. They go, blessing, holiday, jet out, do the. They don't think for a minute that maybe God had other plans because they don't have spiritual sight. They just think, oh, it's so hard to come to church. Oh, it's just so hard to do these things. They don't see. You don't know how many times I've prayed in the last few years. God, they don't get it. God, help them to get it. Discouragement couples with spiritual blindness. And I'll say this, it's a reciprocating problem because then when you're spiritually blind, you become more discouraged. And then when you're discouraged, you don't have faith, you don't see, and just vicious cycle, as we say. Communion with Christ opens blind eyes. Opens blind eyes. You want your spouse to come to Christ? Commune with him. Commune with him. Commune with him. So this communion with Jesus opened their blind eyes, but also Jesus set their hearts on fire. The Bible says in verse 32, they said to each other after they had their eyes open, they recognized him. They said, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? They started realizing that, hey, something happened on the inside. See, I want to tell you, low spiritual flame is discouraging. It is. Not having zeal and passion, it's discouraging. Have you ever seen uh, uh, sporting events and some of the players on the field are looking for some motivation and trying to see something happen? And they'll like look to the crowds, right? And they'll start, you know, they're trying to get the crowd to be enthusiastic. See, it's very easy to look and go, oh man, those guys are just proud. They just want all the glory. No, that's not what they're trying to do. They're trying to, get some, some, some fire going. They're trying to get some motivation going. And in the Christian life, when you have a low spiritual flame, discouragement is easily attached to who you are. And that's why when you commune with Jesus, it's impossible to keep that spiritual flame low. They said, did not our hearts burn Within us, listen to this, while he talked to us, they were listening, on the road. Do you catch those words there? It wasn't like, hey, let me take you aside and take you to the spiritual uh, retreat center and get you guys all fired up again. Here, let me get you into this special uh, uh, seminar that we have just for people like you. And we're going to just bring way encouragement to your life. No, that's not how it happened. It was while they were on the road. Jesus was there. Their hearts began to burn. Fire began to build up. Their hearts were smoldering, but very soon they became flaming. It says, while he opened to us the scriptures, that's another significant and important thing. If you had a paper Bible, I'd tell you to underline it because that's an important thing. It's the scriptures that bring fire. It's the scripture that starts that flame going. 
not that you take the pages out of a Bible and put them in a, 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 in a fire to get going. No, when you read them and apply them and believe them over and over again, it starts to build a fire in you. I wrote this down. I said, open the scriptures for yourself so the spirit of Jesus can open them to you. When you begin to read the Bible and pray, God, show me this, things begin to happen. Maybe not the first time. As a matter of fact, I'll prophesy. The first time, you might feel zero. But after time, and if you can't read, I, I doubt there's many that are like that. We live in a country where most people can read. But if you can't, man, there's, there's also that kind of uh, 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 scripture that, I, I mean, kind of, uh, in your Bible, you can listen to it. That's what I'm trying to say. Their hearts were set on fire by communing with Jesus in the scriptures. But he also, Jesus did this. They didn't do this. Jesus did this. Jesus renewed their spiritual destiny. I want you to think for just a minute here. Let's say all this had happened, okay? We had Jesus died, went and saw these uh, angelic beings, and they said, hey, man, why do you seek the living amongst the dead? And the women saw this, told the disciples, and the disciples said, ah, I don't believe it. Then a couple of followers went on the road and had this encounter with Jesus. Their hearts began to burn. Their, their eyes were blinded, but now they saw, and now their hearts began to burn. Uh, uh, you know, if we stopped right there, we might just say, well, that's an interesting and mysterious experience. Because sometimes that's as far as people's Christianity goes. It's, it's interesting, interesting. I've talked with people who are unbelievers and, hey, tell me about what you believe. I tell them about what they believe. Tell them about Jesus. In my mind, I'm like, come on, come to Christ. Let's pray a prayer. Let's lead you to the Lord. And they're like, hmm, interesting. It's as far as it goes. Some, some Christians just want mystery. Dim the lights down low, light a few nice candles. Uh, let's go in and intrigue, play some uh, chanting music. Uh, and their spiritual encounter is mysterious and, that moves them, and that's as far as they go. And if that's all we read, that's all we would get. But I'm here to tell you that more happened, more happened than just interesting and mysterious. Didn't end there. Verse 33, Luke 24, 33. And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together. That may sound just so mundane, so ordinary, but I'm here to tell you this thing is packed with info for people who are on the rise from discouragement. First of all, as they communed with Jesus, their eyes were open, their hearts were set on fire. The Bible says they rose, they got up, they were going to do something about what had happened to them. So oftentimes we don't do the simple things. You know, God speaks to us in a church service. We start reading our Bible regularly and now we're like getting revelation and then we're praying and we're, all these things are starting to work together. Hey, how did the pastor know about that? Uh, how did that brother, he was talking to me about that. How did all that happen? Uh, the, uh, God knows. Now what are you going to do with it? For them, they could have just sat there and said, well, we're in Emmaus now. There you go. But the Bible says they rose, they got up, they did something about it. Sometimes the next step, brother, the next step, sister, is to get up and to move. You say, where do we move? Well, let me just, before I get to that, let me just tell you that they did this the same hour, <laughs> the same hour. They didn't pray about it. They didn't wait on it. They didn't go get counsel. Sometimes you need to wait. Sometimes you need to pray. Sometimes you need to get counsel. In this case, they had heard from God. They knew what the Lord expected of them. Because you remember, they were not unbelievers. These were faithful followers of Jesus who had allowed discouragement into their hearts. They were lacking confidence. But when you have a communion with Jesus, now you regain that confidence. Now you're ready for the next step, that same hour. I just want to tell you this. Please remember this. God's opportunities require response. If God gives you an opportunity, 
It requires response. It requires action on your part. Okay? Open doors. Let me believe God opens doors. You got to go through those doors. You say, God, open a door for me to get a better job. You apply, they call you in for an interview. What if you didn't show up for the interview? God opened the door, but you didn't go through the door, right? That's your part. It's your responsibility. Sometimes God is calling you to some sort of ministerial task, helping out in the church, being part of uh, the Sunday service in some way, shape, or form, uh, something a little bit more formal than what you've been doing. What are you going to do? Are you just going to stay there and go back to what you always know, or are you going to rise the same hour? See, not every opportunity requires immediate or quick response. I've said that. But many do, and it's easy. Listen to this. It's easy to lose personal momentum when you fail to respond. You take too long. We have this term. I don't know if it's a British term, but we use it. Dilly-dally. Don't dilly-dally. You know, it's like a kid. You know, a kid. You know, you're trying to walk to the shop, and the kid's kicking rocks in the cans and finds a bug on the ground, and they're looking at the bug, and then they pick up this stick and make it like a little hat. Our kids were always on microphones because they always saw us with microphones, so they're, like, pretending like they're preaching. I'm like, stop, we're going here. Don't dilly-dally. Sometimes as Christians, we dilly-dally. When God has called us, get on it. Don't wait till Monday to start your Bible reading. Do it today. God's been calling you to faithfulness. Don't wait till next week or you get the job offer or kids start to change or that feeling comes back. The same hour. Arise. It says they, in that same hour, they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. They were going back to where they belonged. This was going to be the, the hub Jerusalem was going to be what we might call like the the home church. This was going to be the place where God was going to send missionaries throughout the Asia churches, the Middle Eastern area. That was all going to be happening through Jerusalem. God knew that. They didn't. But they needed to get back to Jerusalem. For some of you, you just need to get back. Not to a nostalgic feeling. You know, I could sit here and tell you so many stories about what happened in 1985 and, you know, 92 and 2006. And, you know, we could go over these things. And you you talk to people who are my age. Sometimes I, I, I don't even want to talk to people my age because all they want to talk about is, oh, I remember when, when this happened. And that happened. And there's nothing wrong with using that as a memorial stones and a foundation for your life. But when we talk about getting back to where you belong, we're not talking about going backwards in time. We're talking about getting back on the road that God has ordained for you to be before you got discouraged. (laughs) I'm going to take your silence as you're understanding this, right? (laughs) I'm just going to assume that it's some of it's sticking and getting through. See, discouragement, and this is why you got to get back on the road, and they had to go back to Jerusalem because discouragement could cause you to drift and deviate from your plan. That's why it's so deadly. That's why you have to be careful. Don't waddle. Uh, what's the word? Wallow. That's the word. Wallow in your discouragement because sometimes it feels good to be discouraged. Oh, I'm just going to sit on my couch and put on a blanket and get myself a big bowl of comfort food and, you know, whatever that is. We all have our own comfort food. And I'm just going to sit here in dark and, uh, you know, just binge out on on Netflix, you know, and just going to, and it's going to feel good. I'm going to tell you, that might feel good, but the ramifications of that are horrible, are horrible because they're long-lasting Your one night of binging on Netflix and comfort food is one thing, but it's the long-lasting effects of discouragement are just devastating. Take it from a man who's had to see the, the crash and burns of just far too many when they've been in this discouraged mode. 
they returned to Jerusalem. They got back to where they belong. Is God speaking to you today? If he is, you got to rise the same hour. Can't wait, can't procrastinate. Get back to where you belong. Then it says they found the 11. (laughs) This is something important. God had ordained a team of 12, right? Plus one. He had ordained this team and he, they went back and went to go talk to the other ones because God's plan, listen to this, God's plan almost always involves partnership. It always involves partnership. You know, there, there are some people that, and, and I don't want to say that this is demonic or, or, or wrong, but, but I don't care for this is when people have like their name and then put ministries after it, like Tom Watson Ministries. Because that gives the impression that, you know, this ministry, whatever it is, revolves around that person and that person's name. Now I get sometimes we have to say, hey, we're having Pastor Emmanuel Herrera coming. Hey, Pastor Emmanuel, and that's fine. But I want to say to you that your destiny involves somebody else. It involves a group like your church. That's why it's not good just to be bouncing from this church to that church. And I get sometimes we, we like particular music groups or we like a particular preacher that has some information or some style of preaching that really moves us. I, I totally understand that. And I'm not criticizing that, but I'm saying that these guys understood I need to be with the 11. And the reason I, I'm telling you this in this way is because there was more than just 12 disciples in all of the the area at that time. Jesus had been preaching. There were many, many people. We know just by reading scripture, there were uh, 70, a group of 70 that he sent out, you know. And so there were at least 70 other disciples. There were probably thousands. But they went back to the 11. You know why? Because that's where they belong. I've had people, you know, I've tried to encourage someone that was trying to say, "Ah, don't want to be... Sit, you to be my pastor anymore. Okay, that's fine. Why are you going? Uh, because you said this or did that. Okay, uh, fair enough. Can I give you an explanation? Nope, nope, nope. I'm out. Okay, fair enough. Go, go wherever you like. But you're going to have to land somewhere, bro. You're going to have to find some place that you're going to serve. Some place that you're going to partner with. These guys understood that. That's why these dis- formerly, I'll say formerly discouraged disciples made a decision, hey, I need to get back to Jerusalem. I need to get back with the 11. This is the, the group that God has ordained for my life. There is one last verse here that's an extremely significant verse It's verse 36. We haven't read it yet. Luke 24, verse 36. So these discouraged disciples have gone through all of this, met and communed with Jesus. Their eyes were open. Their hearts were set on fire. They uh, went back to Jerusalem, returned back to where they belong, got involved with the group that they needed to be involved in. And look what verse 36 says. Luke 24 36, as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them. He was in the midst of what I just described. Jesus was present there. And this is what he says. He says to them, long discourse. Here's the 12 steps. Here's the the big thing. Here, get the big pick. No, he says, peace to you. You're on the right road now. You're seeing things. You're feeling, sensing, understanding things. You're making good decisions. You're not just laying back. You're you're, you're moving forward. He says, peace to you. Can I tell you from being a formerly discouraged man at times, just hearing about the peace of God and sensing the peace of God, oh, that's like a healing balm. It's like a salve on a, on an open wound, you know. It feels so healing, so refreshing, so strengthening. And that's what Jesus gives to those who he communes with and opens their eyes, sets their hearts on fire. They rise and do the things God has them to do. 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord God, for your scriptures. I thank you for these particular passages, God, concerning these discouraged disciples and the revelation that you bring to us. I'm asking today, Lord God, for those who are, particularly for those who are feeling discouraged, that they would receive encouragement today, that they would not be lacking hope, that they would find the courage they need to carry on. I pray that we would all walk in confidence, not the confidence of our own flesh, our own will, our own determination, but the confidence that you're standing amongst us. You're with us. We're thankful for that today. In Jesus' name. Today, I'd like for us all to stand to our feet. If we could just do that, stand to our feet today. I want to pray for my brothers and sisters today. Pray for my brothers and sisters. Pray for those who are Christians. But maybe God is tugging at you, speaking to you concerning these issues that we're talking about today in any way, any way, shape, or form. There are some people thoroughly discouraged, right? Thoroughly down, their whole minds down, their heart. There's that. But then there are degrees of it where you're just feeling like I'm just down a little bit. I'm not feeling myself. It's not going the way it should be. You're feeling this discouragement. Maybe, maybe even know the reason for that discouragement. Please don't try to overanalyze this. If you need encouragement, if you need your eyes open and your heart set on fire, if you need to be on the right road, let us pray with you. Please, let us unite. Let us at least do that for you. And if that's you, come on up to the front. Let us pray for you today. Is there anybody like that here? Hallelujah. Praise God. One, two, three. Praise God for you. Anybody else? Four. Thank God for each one of you. You need prayer. You need prayer. I'm taking a little bit of time because I'm going to say this. If you don't come for prayer, and again, I, I, I'm not, this isn't to force you into it, but I want you to see something. If you're not asking for prayer, that means you're fully encouraged. Your eyes are open, your heart's on fire, it's all good. And if that's you, praise God for you. Praise God for you. But if it's not you and you need prayer, please come. Please come. Please come. No one's going to challenge you and criticize you. We're going to rejoice with you so we can pray together as brothers and sisters in Christ, as a family of God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Aren't you feeling better already just coming up to the front, even right here after what you've heard? So let's lift our hands to the Lord and let's just pray and ask the Lord to meet every need. Heavenly Father, we do come before you today so grateful and thankful, God, for your goodness and your grace and your mercy. God, I thank you for my brothers and sisters uh, who have needs in their life and they admit that they have needs because you can answer those needs. Uh, you can bring uh, encouragement. You can build confidence. Uh, you can open blind eyes, my God. Lift the shackles uh, from their eyes, the scales from their eyes, Lord God. Uh, help them to be able to see uh, what they previously could not see. God, help them to understand in their hearts what they previously could not understand. Help them to remember what they've forgotten so that they can walk out, Lord God. Rise up the same hour and begin to proceed along the road, Lord, that you have for them. Thank you, thank you, thank you, God. Thank you for your goodness and your grace and your mercy, my God. Oh, Ramo Sikeri Aba Sandara Ramo Yende. Hide Rebo Sende Remo Kanda Raba Sike. Shereba Rimbo Kete Reba Siko Riama Yande Rebo Sende. Lord God, Lord God, Lord God. Thank you for meeting needs here today. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for infiltrating our hearts. Today, we put our trust, confidence in you. Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's give him a high praise today. High praise. Lift your voice. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you all for listening today. I want to pray over all of us as we dismiss. Don't forget we have tea and coffee and 
uh, some sort of treat out there that you guys are more than welcome to have and say hi to a brother or sister. If you have time, you can spend, have a talk, a word of encouragement. You never know how that's going to end. Thank you for joining us today at Aspire Church. If the message today has blessed you or there's something we can help you with, we'd love to hear from you. Send us an email to info at aspirechurch.co.uk. We meet in different locations throughout the week. And if you'd like to join us in person, we'd love to have you visit us. You can find all the details on our website at www.aspirechurch.co.uk. Or if you'd like further information, find us on Facebook, look us up on Twitter. We also live stream all of our services. And once again, if you'd like to view online, you can find all the details on our website. Thank you for joining us today, being part of our ministry. We'd love to help you in any way that we can. God bless you.